So our next presenter will be Professor Liane Urada. She is professor from the assistant professor from the UCLA and uh, she UCSD. UCSD? It yeah. is on your bio sketch, I'm sorry, oh, this is CNN. I graduated from there, that's right. <laughs> so, okay, from UCSD, and she graduated on social welfare, and uh, she will present uh, a work done to, to identify some risk factors associated with HIV acquisition, uh, antiretroviral uptaking, and viral load suppression. Well, I'm really honored to be here and also to have participated for the past two years um, with uh, PI Dr. Raj in a longitudinal evaluation study that's um, part of a Kaiser community-based HIV test and treat nationwide initiative. I'm really excited because the results are, are now out and so I'll be presenting on the baseline results today. So just as background, the, as you probably know, the National HIV Strategy really aims to increase access to HIV care and to improve HIV-related out health outcomes such as ART antiretroviral treatment utilization for people living with HIV. And this is to um, really, uh, the goal is really to um, both increase access to um, HIV services but also to achieve viral su suppression in people living with HIV. So understanding the structural and behavioral risks that impede these goals are important for future interventions. And so therefore, this study evaluates the structural and behavioral risks associated with recent HIV service ut utilization, um, current use of ART, and known viral load suppression. So my study examines the baseline data collected from seven communities in the US. So in the San Francisco, Oakland area, the transgender woman in Oakland, woman, um, in Los Angeles, black and Latino, um, men who have sex with men, uh, both in the bathhouses and in downtown Skid Row. Um, and then on the East Coast, we have Prince George's County, which is right outside of Washington, D.C., rural African Americans. Um, New Jersey, which are um, injecting drug users and substance users. Um, New York, which are um, paro um, parolees and uh, North Carolina, again, rural African-Americans. And as you can see, um, the highest prevalence is in the South, particularly in Florida. So this is not a completely representative population, but it is one that's targeted the uh, minority populations at, uh, highest, at highest risk and uh, facing the most disparities. Okay, so. My baseline survey, da survey data were collected from these sites, and overall there were 504 HIV-positive participants. And my hypotheses were that structural and behavioral risks were associated with the following outcome variables. So first, utilization of HIV services, both medical and non-medical, for the past six months. Um, current ART uptake and known viral load, and um, a subset I, I examined those who had viral load suppression. And that was because there's actually many who did not know their viral load status. That's why we looked at known versus unknown as well. Um, the independent variables were structural risks, such as race, ethnicity, gender, sexual orientation, age, employment, medical insurance, healthcare access, housing, um, the significant homeless population. Uh, behavioral risks, past 30 day illicit drug use, past three months sex trade, unprotected sex, both vaginal and anal. Um, intercourse, uh, past year use of social services, and um, looking at controlling for time since diagnosis. Um, the data were analyzed via multivariable logistic regressions. And these were some of the demographics of this population. So we have the average age was 43, median was 45, similar. Participants were 73% African American, 17% Latino, 59% male, and 62% um, identified as gay or bisexual, but uh, many also did not ad identify um, and, or disclose. Uh, females, 36% uh, lesbian, bisexual, uh, and about 32% female. 
Eight um, percent were transgender women, and, and most of um, over eighty percent were actually in the San Francisco area, where there's um, a lot of services for transgender women. So you'll see how that affects the results. Overall, forty-eight percent identified as gay, lesbian, or bisexual. Um, Thirty percent did not have a high school degree. Over half were disabled, and forty percent were not employed full time. In terms of the poverty level, 81% had incomes of less than 1,000 a month. And uh, as, as you could tell from the map, most were living in um, large cities uh, where, where, it's, it's, where it's expensive. 22% um, were homeless, over 30% incarcerated in the past 12 months. 39% used drugs in the past 12 months. And of these, 6% injected drugs in the past 30 days. A quarter had sex with multiple partners in the past 90 days. 8% um, sold sex. 17% had unprotected anal, anal sex. 10% unprotected vaginal sex. Um, about 44% 40, were legally married. Um, and also, in terms of uh, the time since diagnosis, about 15% were diagnosed less than a year. Um, over 53% were diagnosed 10 or more years. So, um, there were many who had been diagnosed for a long time, and 28% um, were diagnosed less than five years. Okay, so 35% um, received no HIV services in the past six months. 39% were not on ART. This is at baseline. And 44% did not know the viral load. Only 30% had an unde undetectable viral load, and um, this was defined as less than 50 copies. And 14% had a detectable, detectable viral load. So um, there were many who did not know their viral load status at all, 44%. So my multivariable analyses, HIV care acquisition was associated with being a transgender woman, being employed, insured, having unprotected anal sex, receiving alcohol drug treatment and professional psychological services. So for, so for those last three, it might really um, speak more to the population because it might be surprising that um, unprotected anal sex was associated with higher um, HIV care utilization. And this is just a quote to characterize the population a little better since tr uh, transgender women you know, were seven times more likely to utilize services. Um, one said, we talk about how my PTSD is where I am at on the scale of depression, bipolar, ADHD. This was a 54-year-old transgender woman. And so they're, um, because they, they're facing so many multiple vulner vulnerabilities, then um, this may also explain why um, being engaged in different types of treatment has also helped them utilize HIV care. So for current ART use, it was more likely that they were transgender women again, less likely if they were lesbian, gay, or bisexual. They were more likely to be on ART if they were medically insured and HIV diagnosed for a longer time compared to less than three months. Um, but they were less likely if they injected drugs in the past 30 days. And um, just on side note, 19% were uninsured and 75% um, had Medi-Cal. And again, this is a quote from a transgender woman who is 71 years old. Um, I have cancer, AIDS, hepatitis C. I'm diabetic. I'm on 47 pills a day. So this kind of speaks to, again, the multiple um, vulnerabilities, especially living with HIV for a long time and having to take a, a lot of other non-HIV medications. OK, they were more likely to know the viral load status if they were a female transgender woman medically insured, diagnosed for a year or more, and currently on ART. And then taking a subset, because again, many did not know their status, so for those who did know their status, they were more likely to be virally suppressed if they were diagnosed for at least 10 years. They were likely not to be virally suppressed if they needed health care, um, but couldn't get it, and if they had unprotected anal intercourse. So not having access to medical care seems to be a really um, big theme here. So gender identity and sexual orientation, in conclusion, appear to affect HIV service and ART use. 
with transgender women being more medically inherent than men. But again, we have to remember that 80% um, of the transgender women in this study were from the San Francisco area where they do have um, access to hormone treatment and a lot of um, services. Insurance also had an important bearing on these outcomes, and this is really interesting in light of the Affordable Care Act and the efforts to really get people insured. This, so this at baseline really was a major barrier and continues to be a barrier, for, especially for those struggling with health literacy type of issues and getting, getting appointments, continuing to struggle with that. Um, surprisingly, after accounting for these risks, few behavioral risks emerged as important. Although injecting drug use was associate, associated with not using ART and um, unprotected anal intercourse with di detectable viral load. So um, I think the take home message here is that availability really does not ensure access nor utilization. So whether we're talking about um, health insurance or HIV services, um, there really remains social and structural barriers that need to be addressed. Um, uh, we also did conducted 50 qualitative interviews so far, and um, a lot of the themes have to do with stigma, um, substance use, and being uninsured. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Oranda, to bring this uh, very important topic, which Sometimes we don't take into account when we, it's very important when we plan for, for the treatment of HIV. At least in our setting, we don't take it in, into account and we get surprised when we have problems with adherence with our patients. So I'm open for the discussion, please. Now we have many people. Uh, very different than what's seen nationally and certainly here in San Diego. I know you said that a lot of them are represented in San Francisco where they do have great access to care. Are there any other thoughts about these findings? Because they're, they're really very different than what we see nationally. Right, in terms of the transgender population? Or yeah, how engaged they seem and... and really, I, I just was fascinated by that. Right, well, uh, for that site, uh, the, having a drop-in kind of center specifically for transgender women that, were, that are run by transgender women seem to be very effective. They don't even have the medical services on site there, but there's been a lot of positive feedback about that. And um, they, it's in Oakland, and so they travel from San Francisco to Oakland even to come to that site which is not always um, uh, attractive to them because they have a lot of stereotypes about Oakland, but there's also many living in Oakland as well. So um, I think that's been important in terms of looking at thinking about interventions with the population. Yeah. But there's still uh, many who are, uh, there's still a lot of stigma and uh, it's actually some of the structural issues going on there, there's a lot of violence. So um, there's also been difficulty outreaching to them as well because of the violence they, fa they face. So it's kind of double-edged sword. I, I, mean, I think there's violence everywhere, but there too. I was just curious about the injection drug use uh, issue. And did you have a sense from your work what contribution in terms of obstacles to antiretroviral use were posed by the complicated lifestyle of injecting drug use behavior or the reluctance of the provider to prescribe antiretroviral therapy to people who might have had a recent injection drug use behavior? Right, well, uh, the one thing earlier on in the study, and this is just with substance use in general, not, not necessarily injecting drug use, but in um, downtown LA, they were having uh, problems on Skid Row with people selling their medications. So uh, there, that does pose, you know, that did pose reluctance to give the medications to them because it's covered by um, ADAP, so it's free medications for them, but then they can sell it on the street for a lot. So um, that was the first year, but second year when I interviewed them again, they were saying they actually addressed that barrier. So they were still um, giving, they were giving the medications, but they somehow were able to, um, 
stop them from being able to sell it. And I can't remember specifically what that, the, remember, yeah, what that strategy was. Um, in terms of the injecting drug users, um, that uh, many were based in New, at the New Jersey site, the one-stop shop was really effective for them because they could go there for um, uh, clean needles, you know, needle exchange, and um, services, medical services, as well as uh, the psychosocial type of services. So I think that really uh, helped help them because again, it removed the stigma of being an injecting drug user. Uh, I think this was terrific. I think it's a great idea to look at these issues because the problem we have with linkage and retention to care is the major obstacle we're, we're facing now. I note your uh, project sites are uh, very geographically dispersed and some of them are different in terms of inner, being more in the inner city, some in the suburbs. And one, the North Carolina site with which I'm familiar is servicing a lot of uh, rural uh, patients. And my sense is there could be enormous differences in the nature of the challenges based on the location and circumstances of each site. Were you able to look at site to site variability and difference to try and figure that out? Because my sense of the way to address this is you have to understand it in a regional sense, not necessarily as a conglomerate of all the different sites which represent quite different populations. Right, so uh, the numbers uh, are small, especially in a couple of sites, so we were reluctant to do that in terms of, well, I think more in terms of looking at the effects of the interventions. But in terms of um, the baseline, I, we could at least characterize it. I think it's just um, because some of the numbers are smaller at certain sites, and that's why we didn't do it. But um, that's definitely been a thought to control, control for sites at least. I think a lot, a lot of the questions have to do with how generalizable this is related to the sampling strategy that Chuck was just talking about, but also what was the refusal rate to participate? Um, In other words, when you were recruiting the, the subjects. Right. Um, so for each site, again, yeah, that would, that would vary, and um, there's actually a control group and a treatment group for each site. Um, oh, let's see. There were, there were definitely some sites where, for example, in LA, the, in the bathhouses, where there, there was a challenge in getting people to agree to participate because it's largely an undocumented population, so they're, they were afraid of being arrested, so they didn't want to participate in the study. Um, they, uh, so there was definitely a refusal rate, but I don't have the site's uh, refusal rate right now. Thank you, though, for that question.